I'll stop. Yeah. Schedule to stop in a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay, I, I gave a version of this talk at uh, the Pell Conference, formerly the APS uh, about three months ago now, and it was a much longer talk, it was close to an hour, so I'm really going to rattle through these slides. So if you're interested in more detail, the video has been uploaded, and I'm not going to show you the examples in this um, talk. I'll just wrap it through it, but in the, in the other video I do show examples um, on the command line. So, I guess we've all heard of Dibbic. Um, has everybody used it? Or played around with it? Yeah, generally. Yes, no. Yeah. How many people have used it with uh, legacy, what well, they would call a legacy scheme? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Mm -hmm. no? Okay. So just a little bit about me, this is a company I work for and I think about two years ago now at the Swiss Pell workshop I gave a talk on how we were modernising the front end of the, the, the application. So we were converting a CGI mod Pearl app to modulicious Moose and all that kind of thing. So this is the other half of the app, this is the, the database in the back end because we're working with a 15, 16, 17 year old schema and it has um, all the typical signs of a, a legacy, legacy, a legacy schema. But I wanted to use uh, <coughs> Divic with it because I, I was introduced to Divic about five or six years ago, and from that point on, it's kind of I don't want to go back to what I was doing before, writing manual SQL and taking lots of time to do stuff that we can just have automatically generated for us. Um, and I think if if you're any trivial app, as kind of Don was talking about later on, you are going to be writing a model. Um, and you, you might start with a trivial app, but it's going to grow into something that's not trivial. So you should really try and loosen the coupling and have the abstraction in the correct places. And as I say, you're probably sick of writing trivial SQL anyway. Um, and, but you, you, your trivial SQL might not become so trivial after a while. So the key is to not leave the, ab leave the abstraction. Um, I think the term model is a bit of an overloaded term these days, but I think generally anything that encapsulates the business logic um, in the back end, I th you would kind of term a model, I think, these days. Um, a Dybbuk, it offers quite a, a few useful features <coughs> in general, but for working with a legacy schema, it has quite a few useful things you can do with it. Of course, other ORM slash toolkits are available, but I'm concentrating on Divic here. I think a key distinction to make is the ORM isn't your model. I think some people get a little bit confused over this. It, it's something that helps your model. And you have this typical MVC pattern in an app, and it's a bit misleading because really it's more like a big M and a kind of middleish B and a small C. And then if you add the, the ORM to that, that's Again, a, a distinct part in the application. And the key here is, this is the, the, the Divic syntax. You, you abstract that away into your model class and you don't call that from the controller because you're coupling yourself one to your ORM and two more tightly to the rest of the stack. So if, instead of calling this from your, your controller, so I'm using the example here of a ski resort because I thought that was appropriate to this is helping for workshop. Um, just constructing an object, <coughs> this will be important. So we have that separation of concerns. And the key thing is they don't know anything about the underlying data store. It could be a database or it could be an API or a flat file or whatever. It, it doesn't matter, they don't care. And of course you get this nice exception handling. So this is typically what I would have in the controller. Just calling that model and then catching any exceptions. And we can throw different kinds of exceptions. So here I have a, a database exception, which is things are going badly wrong, so we'll return a 500 server error. Or in this case, I have a, an input exception, so perhaps the params passed in went quite right, so we'll throw a 400 bad request. <coughs> We're handling the web side of the, the, the inputs and the outputs in the controller and everything else is down in the model. 
So just to talk a little bit about what I'm calling a legacy schema. Um, and that's a slightly cynical way to, to look at it. Um, but I think generally it's anything that's grown over time organically. Gus, often databases, they'll stick around for quite a number of years. Um, so if you're using a database from the MySQL four days, you're probably going to find it's been using MyHize and it's not got foreign keys. And if you're still having to maintain that, it's, that's where your technical debt is. And I think technical debt is very hard to fix in the data store. It's more like a, it's more like a mortgage because um, it's something that takes a very long time to pay off. Um, and missing a payment could be quite bad. So what I thought we'd do is look at some of the examples that we have in our application. Um, but some of these are also, they've come from this book here, which is quite, a, quite an interesting book. It's got about 25 or 30 examples in it. And that's not to say that things in this book are a sign of a legacy app, they're generally just anti-patterns. And one or two of them are quite legitimate for some use cases. So I thought I'd come up with a little schema just to um, demonstrate this. And as I said, I, I use the example of a ski resort. So hopefully it's simple enough that people understand it. Have a resort which can have some pieces and it has some installations, uh, ski lifts, things like that. And pieces are linked to installations. And uh, I, I use this because I think it's sufficiently simple that we can all understand it. But it's, it's sufficiently complex that it's not actually that simple. Because if you really dive into the details of it, I have a piece map here. If you look at it in a bit more detail, you find out that well, resorts are actually made up of several small resorts. And you have actually pieces, you have these orphan lifts that link resorts, so they don't really belong to one particular resort. And this is a legitimate concern, because if you get a ski pass, these, certainly in Switzerland, these are all linked to a central database. So if I, if I buy a, a ski pass for Villa, it needs to know that I can't get on this lift because it, that leads to the next result. So <coughs> part of me is curious about how he's implemented this in the back end, but it's going off on a bit of a tangent. Um, but that's not the legacy scheme. The legacy scheme is this version, <laughs> um, which, as you can see, there's no relation, there's no foreign keys here, there's no relationships. And we have we have things that should be booleans when they're defined as chars, and we have a polymorphic relationship here, which I'll explain a bit more after a few slides. But it's purposely, purposely simplistic. Um, so, one of the tools built on top of Divic is this uh, Rapid app, which I won't show the example of, but it's, it's something that you can install from CPAN and run it on the command line. It's a little catalyst app that will give you a nice GUI to the database so you can play around and see the tables and any relationships. And it's quite nice to view, view the, um, the database without having to really delve into it. It gives you a very high level overview of the database. And you might, if you want to do that, you might find some confusing terminology. Certainly in our case, we have a database that was forked. We saw a, a gap in the market and what well, we didn't see it, they saw it. But they fought the database, so we have these tables that are named one thing, but they actually, actually represent something else entirely. And this is very, very confusing at first. <coughs> but that shouldn't matter, because if you're not leaking the abstraction, and you have a model class that actually knows about this slightly confusing terminology, it's not a problem, because you can have um, schema, ski result model piece can be querying anything. But it doesn't matter because it's, it's contained within that one place. We don't have any tables and potatoes to reissue. Um, so the, the big thing I think is uh, relationships, the lack thereof in the legacy schema. And I think, as I said, the, these, this kind of comes out of old technology. My eyes are not supporting it. But I think also people didn't see the advantage of them. Or they thought they're slow, they don't give us anything. Why do it? But the R in our DMS is important. Um, and what you can do with Debit is you can, if your schema is well designed and it has all the relationships, you can just point at it and run. It will generate all the relationships for you and it doesn't matter. 
However, if your database doesn't do that, you have to generate the classes and then add the relationships. So what I have here is a little shell script um, that I use over and I can use it to generate these classes over and over again. So it writes them to disk. And they look something like this. <coughs> so we have our um, ski resort, which this is, this is the resort item table. And as you can see, it's just all this has been automatically generated. So we have the name of the table, the column, the data types. And what we have to do is we have to add relationships at the bottom. So Divic puts a little checksum in to say, don't mess with anything above here, and if you do mess with it, I'll complain. Anything you need to add, do it down here, and you can regenerate this over and over again. So what we do is we add the relationships using Divic's own um, syntax to say, okay, this particular table is linked to this table. And it allows us to use Divic's powerful syntax to query those relationships. And we can do things like prefetching, uh, which would do the joins to get to the other tables. So even though the database doesn't have a relationship is that defined in it, we actually define it in the scheme classes, and it's as if it was there. And you can use this to define relationships that might, even if you have well-designed scheme, you might decide, oh, I want to actually link through some tables here. You can add those to the, the Dewey class, results source classes, as a convenience. And if you are working with a, a legacy scheme, I suggest you don't go and add every single relationship that could possibly exist. It's a waste of time. When you're writing your model classes, if you realize, oh, okay, I need to query these, these tables, just add them as you need them. So we have about 300 tables, I think, in our database, but we've only added relationships for 60 or 70 of them. And um, because the rest of the tables we don't really use because it's their, they're, they're corrupt, basically. And Divic does support the different kinds of relationships. So when you define a schema, you only ever really say, you only ever really use it belongs to. A table only ever belongs to another type of table. Um, you say foreign key, foo, references, bar. You, you don't do it the other way around. But Divic gives us these convenience methods so we can actually do it the other way around. Um, and it has things like a many-to-many -many convenience method. So you can jump through linking tables. If you have one many-to-many -many and then two, you can kind of jump through it. But that's generally discouraged unless you, your data is correctly normalized because what will happen is people will add metadata to the linking table and then realize that they can't get to it through the many to many. Um, yeah, I mentioned polymorphic relationships. So I'm sure we've all seen these, but generally it's where you have a table that has a column to tell you which table to join to and then a column to say what the primary key is in that linking table. And there's something that, they seem like quite an elegant solution um, initially, but really they're more pain than they're worth because you can enforce referential integrity and it pushes all that logic up into your, your application, the database can't do the sanity checks, it would not be do. And again, we can, we can fix, well not fix, but we can hide these in our digital class results class classes. So in the, the case here is we have again we have that relationship which it belongs to, but we pass it a subroutine reference and we're just saying which column is going to which other columns in the other in the other tables and you can have as many or as a few of these as you like. So that again that hides that hides the logic of that polymorphic relationship. And if you have lots of these, which is generally the case, the, the case you can just wrap that in a loop and join the table as necessary. I just can pass that slide there. That's an alternative to using the many-to-many. -many. You can nest search relators in Divic to jump from one place to any other place, as long as you have those relationships defined in the classes. So this is another one, fixing column data, um, or inflating column data. So, Say you have um, timestamps or date times, it's quite nice to get back objects because generally if you're getting back a date time, you probably want to do either uh, logic to present it in the correct time zone for the user or you might want to do arithmetic on that, on that, that column. And 
rather than using your database to do that, you can use Divic and some of its plugins to do, to do that for you. But again, it, it hides that away from you. And the aim here is to make it easier to migrate from one particular engine to another. You'll find that in the case of MySQL, it has different data functions to Classic SQL, to Oracle. And if your SQL has a as this, for example, here, that's going to make it difficult to, to move from one engine to another. So there are many of these helpers on CPAN that hide that for you. I won't go into it here, but you can see the difference it generates. It knows about functions and it hides that away. So the example in the schema I showed earlier on was we had a column that was a, a char and it should be a boolean. And what we can do here is we can say to do it, right, whenever you pull this out of the database, just run this little function and it's converted from one type to another. So we have a lot of this in our database. We have a lot of chars where it's a Y or an N. It should be a boolean. And you can imagine if, if we're pulling this out back into the model and we're having to do every time, okay, is it defined? Is it a Y? Uh, okay, it could be a lowercase Y. You're repeating a lot of yourself there. Do it, we'll just do it for you. So you're saying here, when, when it comes out of the database, run this on it, so I'm returning it one or a zero. When, but of course we need to still support what's in the database. So whenever we put it back in the database, we just do the, the inverse. And it makes the if statement much, much clearer. And again, say you have a column that's a CSV, which again, I don't think is quite a common anti-pattern. You can, you can just split that into a an array reference. Powerful thing here is you could actually enforce referential integrity on this. So if this, if this is a list of foreign keys, you could inspect each element of that array, and then obviously this is going to slow your data to your process down a little bit. But you can say, right, I'm actually going to check and see that those list IDs are valid for our database, and maybe for an exception if it's not. Okay, so we also have a lot of rather complex large queries in our, in our app. And I didn't want to rewrite these as SQL abstracts because, as you can imagine, a 200 line SQL query, rewriting that in SQL abstracts with Divic is it's basically obfuscation, I think. So, what you can do instead is you can, there's a few approaches to this. You can go down to the raw database handle, Divic allows and provides a method to do that. This is, DBX2 is recommended because it continues to use the exception handling. Divic. You can actually get the raw database handle, but you won't get a nice exception handler. Also, you can create virtual views. So what we have here is, like I said, it's a view that exists on the, at the app side, not the database side. So we're just defining the columns and then the SQL that we run. Now, you can imagine if this is two, three hundred lines of SQL, it's quite nice it's just to have it within one module that we can reuse now and again. So that you know, turns it again down to a trivial in your app. The, one of the problems with the virtual views is, say you have a very complex query and you have several minor variations on a theme, you might find that, for example, oh, in this particular case I run it with an extra bind variable. It's not that trivial to do with virtual views, but because they're just simple per modules, it's trivial to extend them. So what I'm doing here is the previous one, I'm just concatenating another bind variable. So because it's returning the same columns. And there is a module to do this automatically on CPAN, which is by Ovid. Um, it's, I think it's still an alpha, maybe because he hasn't got around to making it later. But all it does is basically it builds a virtual view on the fly. Sorry, question? Yeah. <coughs> With visual views, if I return back and I think that's actually a recycled object, mm. is it contained into the object? Yeah, you can, you can add the... Okay. Well, I mean, okay. yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, obviously you, you're probably going to want to do some debugging if you're creating new classes with Divic. And there's a couple of environment variables that are quite useful. One of the one of the things I often end up doing, and I, I keep meaning to make a CPAN model for this, is I end up putting a little bit of extra trace in there um, because whenever I call result set, I want to know exactly where that came from in my application, and this actually becomes quite beneficial because when you start optimizing your database queries and you want to find, okay, am I not prefetching any tables where I should be? 
what this will do after you will print. So I generate this select statement from this line of code. <coughs> and then if you see, you have multiple selects before you get to the next bit of debug, you realize, OK, I'm probably missing some prefetches there. So that's, that's one big thing I would suggest if you start using it. And of course, you can supply connect, connection options. So if your database supports it, then you can set ETF-8 and reconnect. And actually, this is one I've just recently added to our app um, in fast strict mode on any new code. So that's kind of leaving out any potential issues with uh, SQL that we had in the old application. And the gotchas, prefetch. Divic has a, a tendency, if you don't tell it prefetch these tables, it will potentially go quadratic or exponential on the number of queries it could run. So if you have two for each loops, and then you add another one, suddenly you've got a thousand queries where you should just have three or four. So that's where that previous bit of debugging code came in use. This might be difficult if you have a big application, but if you don't, <coughs> this is obviously very useful because again, you can find all those queries that you should be collapsing down. And use the that little script just to keep your results source classes up to date. As I said, you can just regenerate them whenever you update your database. That would probably be part of your um, one that you're deploying. But if you're updating the database in depth, you need to update the results source classes. Because Divic will happily run against a different version of the schema until you ask it for something it doesn't know about, and then it will explode. So that's just a quick summary. I don't think I need to do it given that I kind of condense this part down into 20 minutes. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that I didn't cover. There's all sorts of stuff on CPAN. I think it's about, at the moment, it's about 100 or so distributions related to the class. And there's lots more information if you go on to Cruise Park and join the UPIRC channel. And the, the, the manuals, the, Part on the CPAN is quite comprehensive, which can be a bit daunting at first, but once you get into it, it's, it's very useful. I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah. If you have uh, parts of your data not in the database, but say in a flat file, mm -hmm. does Divic uh, allow you to uh, merge that into the, the, the same model? Or? I'm not sure it does, but if you're using a model, if you're writing a model class, you can have, say, for example, here we had the, the piece class. Maybe some information it gets from the database, maybe some information it gets from a flat file or an API. If that's contained within the piece.pm, it doesn't matter. Because oh, you, okay, yeah. called you can put it there and then you yeah, that's where the I would put it. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's the theory. You have that loose mm -hmm. completely through the, through the step. Mm -hmm. Any more questions?